uh, construction site. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I think uh, Philip, we can't see Philip. Is everything okay, Philip, with your camera? Yeah. Yes. You, you, you will yeah, it's time to Maybe start. Philippe stepped away before the big show starts. Yeah, Philippe, are you there? Is, uh, you, can you, could you please switch he's on here, your camera? He's here, Yeah. But not the camera. Not the camera, yeah, that's it. I think he changed the camera. Okay, it's time now. Uh, Shall we have Philippe back? Okay. Should we start? Yes, we should start now. Okay, oh, one second. Uh, okay, dear friends, dear basic income advocates, welcome. Before starting our workshop, we would like to share a few technical issues. This workshop will be held in English and will be simultaneously interpreted to Korean Two, in order to follow the simultaneous interpretation uh, in your Zoom webinar controls, please click interpretation. Then choose and click the language that you would like to hear. And uh, optionally, in order to hear the interpreted language only, you need to click mute original audio. It is in the screen. Let me share like this. Okay, in your, in your Zoom webinar controls, please click interpretation and then choose and click the language that you would like to hear. Optionally, in order to hear the interpreted language only, you need to click mute original audio. And uh, this workshop will be held using the Zoom webinar format. At the first stage, we will be able to hear the contributors mentioned in the workshop program. And at the second stage, during the questions and answers and contributions session, we will be able to receive the contributions and questions of the webinar attendees. Uh, now let's wait for our friends for a few seconds to make their interpretation choices. I guess we can start. Okay. Yeah. Uh, dear friends, dear basic income advocates, very welcome to our international workshop on basic income manifestos for presidential election 2022 in Korea. Uh, this is Alimutu Kyrgyzoglu. Uh, this workshop, oops, okay here. This workshop is uh, co-organized by BN, Basic Income Earth Network, Worldwide Meetings of UBI Advocates and UBI Networks, BIKN, Basic Income Korean Network, and research team for study on the feasibility of basic income for real utopia, National Research Foundation of Korea. Uh, since several years, especially after the basic income world Congress held in Seoul, Korea in 2016, many of our friends were very closely following the basic income related discussions and news in Korea. In March, 2022, there will be a presidential election in Korea again where basic income is an important part of the political discussions. And there are two presidential candidates who are for basic income. The idea uh, or the aim behind this workshop was to have a better understanding of the basic income manifestos for presidential election 2022 in Korea, and to have a panel session to hear the thoughts of our friends who are basic income activists, researchers, and advocates. Uh, if you go to the program, uh, the program will start with very short welcome contributions. And uh, there will be a presentation uh, by Nam Hong Kang, Professor Dr. Nam Hong Kang. Uh, his title will be Basic Income Manifestos, Manifesto of Presidential Candidate Mr. J. Ming Lee from Korea. After this presentation, we will have a panel session. Uh, the panel session will be moderated by uh, our dear friend Sarat Dawala, chairperson of BN, Basic Income Earth Network. And then we will receive the contributions of the panelists, uh, Guy Standing, Philip Ampari, Annie Miller, Carl Weidergrist, Valeria Korostech, Ali Mutlu Kyoyloğlu, Huyo Sang Ahn, and Yunho Oh. So I am 
talking very quickly because you have all these details. Uh, and after the panel session, there will be a questions and answers and contribution session. It will be moderated again by dear, uh, our dear friend Sarat Davala. So uh, it will be uh, very beneficial, I guess, this question and answer session. So this is the uh, this is the program of our meeting. Uh, at this stage, before giving the word to our dear friends, I would like to mention that uh, worldwide meetings of UBI advocates and UBI networks aim is to introduce additional tools for communication, interaction, and collaboration between UBI advocates and UBI networks. And today we are very happy to co-organize this workshop together with BN, Basic Income Earth Network, BIKN, Basic Income Korean Network, and research team for study on the feasibility of basic income for real utopia, National Research Foundation of Korea. We hope this workshop will be very beneficial to basic income discussions and will be another valuable ring in the chain of basic income advocacy efforts. Thank you very much. Now I would like to give the word to our dear friend Hyo Sang Ahun, chairperson of Basic Income Korean Network. Dear Hyo Sang, please. Hyo Sang, you are muted. Thank you very much, Ali, for that introduction. Nice to meet you all. My name is uh, Hyo Sang An, the uh, chairperson of the Basic Income Korea Network. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, us in this workshop to uh, discuss the Basic Income Manifesto in the uh, presidential election of Korea. Uh, recently, uh, there is a question. Will Korea become the first country in the world to introduce basic income? Uh, perhaps. But as you may uh, anticipate, there will be many challenges. Uh, basic income supporters and campaigners in Korea are working hard to overcome those challenges and fight even harder after the presidential election. I believe uh, basic income lays a foundation for all people to live better lives and give opportunities. I hope uh, today's workshop uh, can be an opportunity uh, for the uh, basic income campaign in Korea uh, and uh, in the world uh, to take, take a step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, hyo -san. Thank you, Ali. Um, on behalf of Basic Income Earth Network, I would like to welcome all of you, all the panelists and all the participants of this webinar. And I'm really, really delighted to have such a wonderful global community of scholars and political workers and people who are passionate about basic income. Uh, this, as you have, as Ali has pointed out, this is a collaboration of four different organizations and uh, who are equally strongly working on basic income in different capacities. This is uh, not going to be a one-off uh, session but uh, we plan to have a series of such uh, webinars on this particular theme. The whole idea, uh, as my colleagues have already pointed out, is to stimulate an informed debate on basic income so that we, the discussion about whenever, whenever a manifesto comes, whenever a politician announces, a uh, policymaker announces anything by calling it a basic income, I think we should, it's important that we create an atmosphere of informed uh, debate on this. Ultimately, all of us um, uh, would like a basic income policy in every single country in this world. <clears throat> I, and so that we also aim that it should become a policy common sense to talk about basic income in its real sense. So as a community, we would like to follow these developments in the world closely and have a parallel discourse on the rights and the wrongs and the possibilities and the uh, not, so, not so possible things. But at the same time, as all of us believe that we all would like to work for that utopia we all believe in. So I would stop here and I, uh, I think welcome Professor Nam Hoon Kang to make his presentation, which will actually 
open this webinar. Can you all hear? I can't hear it. Cannot hear. I cannot hear. Unmute. Unmute. Yeah, I can't hear the interpreter as well. Now you need to uh, unmute. You are speaking, but I think you should unmute yourself. Well, my microphone was muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, for uh, international participants, let me introduce the candidate, Mr. Jae Myung Lee. So uh, he was a boy born to a uh, family of uh, slash and burn farmers in uh his family was very poor uh, to the extent that he had to walk uh, five kilometers every day to school. Uh, in the uh, middle school, uh, he worked as a boy worker for two years. So at that time, uh, working at that age uh, in a factory in Korea was illegal. So he worked under a pseudonym. Uh, he suffered two industrial accidents and uh, became disabled. And because of the poverty and uh, sufferings uh, in his family, he attempted suicide uh, twice. And luckily, uh, the uh, pharmacist uh, gave him a uh, digestive pill, not the uh, sleeping pill. Uh, so uh, he didn't uh, succeed. So, uh, he was uh, self-taught. Uh, to uh, have the opportunity to uh, sit the uh, college entrance exam, uh, enter the Chungang University uh, College of Law. And it was when he was uh, an undergraduate student that he first realized that the uh, uh, democratic uprising of 1980 was actually uh, a uh, proper democratic movement, not a uh, attempt uh, of a rebellion uh, instigated by North Korea. Uh, so he passed the uh, bar exam and entered the Judicial Training Institute. Uh, and he listened to a lecture by lawyer, then lawyer, uh, Mu Hyun Ro, who later became president and decided to become a human rights lawyer. Uh, after some years, he became the mayor for uh, Songnam City. And when he was uh, serving as mayor, uh, there was a meeting uh, back in 2015 in Seoul. I believe some of you here uh, were participants in the meeting. After that meeting, uh, he introduced uh, the youth dividend in the city. And after that, he became the uh, governor for the Gyeonggi province. Uh, in that post, he introduced the youth basic income, farmers basic income, and the rural basic income. And he is now uh, running ahead of all other candidates in the presidential race. So let me move on to the uh, basic income manifesto of Mr. Lee. So first of all, there's national basic income, the basic income for all Koreans. One million Korean won per year. Uh, it's, it's, it's going to be uh, financed by land dividend and carbon dividend from taxation. And then there is basic income by age. There will be uh, youth basic income for those 
between 19 and 29 years old, one more, uh, one, one million Korean one, uh, in addition to the na national basic income. And then there will be child basic income for those aged uh, zero to uh, between zero uh, and 18, uh, 1.2 million Korean one. And there is the basic income for the elderly, which is now under discussion. Uh, and a tentative uh, proposal is to uh, give 3.6 million Korean won to all seniors, which is an expansion of existing uh, basic elderly pension. And the third proposal is rural basic income, providing uh, 0 0.5 to 1 million Korean won to small rural area residents, which is now under discussion. So the debate uh, is whether it's going to be a rural basic income or farmers uh, basic income. Uh, the formula will be a wider uh, category. And other uh, proposals are under discussion, uh, including the basic income for uh, the disabled or artists. So when you sum them up, it looks like this. So if you're aged between zero uh, and 18, the uh, basic income you receive would be about 2.2 million Korean won, which is equivalent to 5.87% of the national GDP. And for children living in rural areas, uh, they uh, won't be uh, eligible to uh, receive uh, both basic incomes, so uh, the expenditure will be the same. For those between 19 and 29 years old, uh, the youth basic income will be uh, 2 million Korean won, which is about 5.3% of the GDP. Uh, and if they live in rural areas, uh, there will be additional 3 million won uh, per year, uh, which will then become about 8% of the GDP. Uh, those between 30 and 64 years old will receive 1 million won uh, in basic income, uh, which is about 2.6% uh, of the GDP. And those aged 65 and over uh, will receive uh, 460, uh, excuse me, 4.6 million Korean won, which will be about 12% uh, of the GDP. All these numbers are tentative. So how uh, are they going to be financed? As for national basic income, there will be land dividend, uh, about 30 trillion won, and carbon dividend, uh, between 10 to 20 trillion won. Uh, basic income by age or category can be financed by expenditure adjustment, uh, up to 25 trillion won, and reduced uh, income tax uh, deductions, which will amount to 12 trillion won. Uh, as for rural basic income, uh, the idea is to uh, raise funds both from the central and uh, local governments. And since this is a presidential uh, election, uh, the uh, manifesto will only cover the central government part. And uh, the financing would be from balancing the regional uh, uh, financing from the uh, balanced regional development budget. Now, uh, the uh, largest challenge seems to be the uh, land uh, dividend. Uh, the amount is the largest and uh, it looks uh, the least uh, feasible uh, in terms of uh, politics. Uh, carbon dividend uh, seems uh, more feasible, uh, thinking about potential uh, resistance from the public. So uh, I'd like to focus more on the land dividend in my presentation. Now this chart uh, shows uh, the uh, land ownership of Korea. Uh, uh, of uh, 22 million households uh, in Korea, about 13 million have a land, uh, a little more than 60%. Uh, so about 40% of all households in Korea don't own any land and the rest own land like this. Uh, you see the march of, uh, you know, 
uh, very little uh, landowners uh, and uh, the uh, very rich uh, 1% uh, landowners, which shows the extreme inequality uh, with the uh, Gini coefficient 0 0.8114, which shows uh, the imperative of land reform in Korea. So how do we design the land dividend? Uh, so basically, uh, the idea is to have a progressive tax rate to uh, have the uh, revenue, which will be divided equally uh, to all citizens. And this uh, is our simulation. So those, the households on the left and in the middle uh, will uh, receive more dividends than uh, taxes paid, and the households on the right side will pay more taxes than the dividends they receive. Uh, so up to 95%, 95% no, uh, will benefit uh, from the land dividend. So this is uh, uh, one of the simulations we are running. So, we believe that at least 90% of the households uh, should have net benefit from land dividend in order to minimize political resistance. Uh, and this is also an example of the land dividend notice. Uh, I'm sorry for showing you these uh, in Korean. Uh, there are three uh, cases here. The first is a four-person household with no house. Now the uh, dividend here uh, is uh, 500,000 Korean won, which is also a tentative number. It could be larger or smaller. And it also depends on uh, the uh, property prices. So this household has no house and all four members will only receive the land dividend. In total, this household will receive 2 million Korean won. And the second example is a four-person household with uh, one house of a market value of about uh, 500 million Korean won. So this household will have to pay uh, 50, uh, 500,000 won in the uh, new uh, land tax. And the dividend will be the same amount. Uh, amount, uh, 500 Korean won. And this is uh, a net zero for the household head, but for the three remaining members, uh, uh, they will uh, only receive the land dividend. So in total, the household receives 1.5 million won. And the last example uh, has a, a more uh, pricey uh, house. So the uh, tax uh, is 900,000 uh, one and the dividend of the uh, head of the household is 500,000 won. Uh, uh, so the uh, net uh, tax paid of the head of the household would be uh, 400,000 won. And the three remaining members of the household will receive uh, the land dividend only. So the household uh, has a net benefit. So this is uh, also an idea to design the land dividend uh, to minimize political re resistance and show them that show them the benefits they have uh, clearly. Uh, so overall, uh, the plan uh, is to uh, phase in basic income, uh, and um, for example, the child basic income. Uh, would uh, start uh, from 18 year old uh, and um, after a couple of years uh, the uh, the age uh, limit uh, will uh, go down now land dividend and carbon dividend so they are based on land value tax and carbon tax. 
And the plan is to introduce them uh, after a six month long uh, deliberative discussion. And after the deliberative discussion, uh, we can uh, think about uh, putting uh, this to a national referendum or a vote of a citizens assembly. Uh, these are some of the ideas uh, still under discussion. So why do we think about uh, deliberative discussion? Now uh, it's because uh, introduction of the land dividend is the second land reform in Korea. So uh, there was uh, the first land reform in Korea in the 1960s when uh, a few Koreans were actually uh, landlords. But now, as you have seen, about 60% of the population have houses, which is a totally different situation. And there is a strong uh, rent-seeking coalition of rich property owners, politicians, bureaucrats, and the media. And the presidential election in Korea has a simple majority system. So the winner gets elected with about 50% of the vote, uh, maybe uh, sometimes less than that. So after getting elected, uh, you need to have a higher uh, support rate for a policy uh, or for the president uh, to uh, initiate such a huge reform. And there is another uh, hurdle, which is the uh, mismatch uh, between the composition of the National Assembly, the Parliament, and the composition of the citizens. 40% uh, of all citizens own no house, while only 15% uh, of members of the National Assembly own no house. And 35% of uh, members of the National Assembly own a multiple number of houses, and actually 25% of them uh, own expensive houses in the uh, three Gangnam uh, districts with the highest uh, property prices. Uh, so uh, it's going to be very difficult uh, for us to uh, have the National Assembly uh, introduce uh, land uh, dividend uh, seamlessly after the presidential election. And we also believe the citizens need uh, to spend uh, some time to learn about the uh, uh, basic income uh, and uh, share their, their ideas. A presidential candidate, Lee Jae-myung, has already experienced this process of deliberation and discussion with citizens in 2018 and 2019. So this uh, process of deliberation uh, was conducted twice by uh, candidate Lee Jae-myung and the participants to this deliberation were selected in consideration of their representativeness, such as gender, age, and region. And after a poll of to select 200 people who were in favor of basic income, 30% in weak opposition, and 30%, another 30% in strong opposition of land dividends. And the deliberation process uh, proceeded for two days and where they held discussions for about 10 hours a day. And there was self-study and experts uh, presentation and Q&A with experts and group discussion. And so we took uh, three polls. The first poll was uh, conducted without any prior learning. And the second one conducted after self-learning uh, using the policy data book. And then the third survey was conducted after uh, the deliberation process. And so regarding the policy of land dividends, at first, if you look at the first survey uh, results, uh, 
uh, the second survey results showed that uh, about 58% of the people were in favor, uh, which was an increase from the first poll results. And then the in the third survey, uh, the discussants voted in favor of land dividends by about 57%. So as you can see, uh, this uh, deliberation and discussion leads to more informed choices. And if you look at this, and after the deliberation, uh, the the smaller your the value of your uh, uh, land real estate property, the more likely you are to be to uh, vote in favor of land dividends. So uh, your uh, political interests become aligned uh, with your uh, actual economic. Uh, interests. And so as for the carbon dividend policy, you can see that the, the percentage of people in favor of the carbon div dividend continue to increase from the first to the second to the third poll. <clears throat> and so our suggestion is to uh, conduct a land dividend deliberation pro process and then uh, conduct a referendum after this deliberation process. So in this proposal A, when it comes to selecting the participants to this process, uh, we will have to look at focus on the uh, property ownership. And since 40% are non-homeowners in Korea. Uh, we will have to in adjust uh, the percentage of participants who are non-homeowners in this deliberation process to make this more reflective of the actual uh, Korean population and their land uh, ownership status. And uh, this proposal is based on the uh, proposal by Bruce Ackerman and James Fishkin on regarding deliberation day. So uh, we will have to pay uh, the participants to participate in the uh, deliberation, like about 10 million uh, one, I beg your pardon, about 100,000 one uh, and also make sure that they don't lose their regular job by participating by taking the day off to participate in the uh, deliberation. But for when it comes to proposal B, the uh, minus side would be that you have only one day uh, for uh, deliberation. And proposal C is uh, putting the land dividend policy to a vote at, at the citizens assembly. The citizens assembly will be made up of about 3000 members who will be selected uh, according to the distribution of real estate ownership, actual distribution of real estate ownership in the Korean population. And the discussion will convene every Saturday or public holiday for about six months. And of course, uh, participation will be paid or re reimbursed. And then uh, we will try to, and this is modeled after the Citizens Council of British Columbia of Canada. Since I've run out of time, I will wrap up here uh, my presentation on the basic income manifesto of presidential candidate Lee Jae Myung. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kang. It was really, really very, very inspiring. And uh, to go into such detail, I think one very interesting thing I have myself noticed about Mr. Lee right from his Songnam days was that he's continuously worked with, along with social scientists, 
and each of his policy initiatives, he has uh, put them to a very tough evaluation. And uh, there is enormous body of literature on all the experiments that have happened. Thank you, Professor Khan. Thank you so much. And uh, now uh, let's move on to the, uh, the panelists. And uh, I'm sure everybody is very eager to share their responses and reactions to this. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really a privilege to be moderating a panel as distinct, which has such distinguished uh, personalities and, uh, and such uh, some of the finest thinkers on basic income are here. They are not just scholars, but also have been very passionate about basic income idea. And at least three of them, the panelists are, have been the co-founders of Basic Income Earth Network. And um, uh, we have different generations of uh, basic income advocates here. And uh, probably I think Carl is the second generation and Josang Ali, myself is the third generation, uh, I would say. Uh, this is really a, a, a pleasure and a privilege. Um, as always, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the time is very short and uh, mercifully and fortunately not as short as the Twitter, but you have each panelist has five minutes to uh, speak and uh, share your contribution. And uh, let us start immediately without much ado. I will start with um, Annie Miller. Um, Annie Miller, as all of you know, um, is the co-founder of BN uh, and uh, co-founder and chair of Citizens Basic Income Trust and a passionate advocate of basic income. Annie, the floor is yours and uh, you have five minutes. Thank you very much, Sarath. Um, I read Governor Lee's income pledge, basic income pledge with much interest, and it's nuanced and innovative, designed to meet the needs of those with least income. I'm sure that each country has to work out what the needs of its population are, and they're going to vary. Uh, I particularly welcome the goals of strengthening women's basic income rights and contributing to gender equality at which, which these manifestos aim. And if the population is educated about this and women have a vote, it really is a, a winner, I would say. Um, there's much in common between the two manifestos of Governor Lee and... Um, uh, and uh, uh, our other person, um, and um, especially in the proposed sources of financing, the new land tax, the new carbon tax, the income tax reform for dividends on knowledge column, commons, and which will lead to a, a sovereign wealth fund, and the reorganization of the tax exemption system, all of which are to be warmly welcomed. Now, comparing the two proposals, Governor Lee's manifesto emphasizes higher basic incomes for one, two, and three person households in year 2023. That's only one year away. While O. Yunho's manifesto emphasizes larger basic incomes for all households by 2026. Now, if this were a different country, they might be, have been persuaded to combine forces on a single joint ticket with Governor Lee as presidential candidate and O oh Yunho as vice president with special responsibility for implementing and financing the basic incomes. But this is uh, South Korea and there's no post of vice president, unfortunately. But some cordial discussion should be able to iron out the current differences for the benefit of everyone. And I'm sure that having two people who are so passionate about, a, a, about, a, about basic income, there ought to be an opportunity for uh, Yunho O's um, expertise to, be, to contribute towards the, the final result. On the other hand, Governor Lee, with all his current experience of governing across a range of policies, he will enhance his reputation as an enlightened president with vision and wisdom, leading Korea through the forthcoming crises 
with courage and foresight. I think it's wonderful how it takes account of both the climate crisis and the uh, rent seeking crisis, which has also been a problem across the world. And I notice it here at home in Scotland. And Oh Yunho would be recognised as the architect of the detail of basic income, implementing in a way that provides the basis for the harmony in the future and the redistribution, protecting the poor people uh, against the rent-seeking um, aspirations of the richer people. So uh, th there's so much discussion. I mean, uh, in Scotland, we're starting the idea of a land value tax and we have um, a land registry, which is going to take some time to complete. Um, the carbon tax is welcome. Obviously, once the carbon tax, the carbon emissions have been reduced, that becomes less important. But by then, there'll be the special citizens' basic income tax to propose this. So it's all of a piece, all carefully thought out to bring uh, to a conclusion a proper basic income for South Korea, for Korea, the Republic. And I had hoped at one time that Scotland might have been the first country to do this, but I bow, I take off my hat to Korea, as I hope will be the first country to implement a basic income, well, uh, countrywide for its citizens. And I commend you all for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annie. Uh, you have saved 50 seconds, which you can use it at the time of Q&A. Um, we are privileged to have Mr. Juno, um, Juno Ho. I'm so, uh, pardon me if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly. Um, Mr. Ho is, he is representing, he's the presidential candidate. It's really a privilege to have him here. And um, he uh, is from the Basic Income Party, which is a new party in Korea uh, formed around the idea of basic income. Welcome, Mr. Ho. Please uh, make your contribution. Five minutes. Good evening. It is an honor for me to make this presentation in front of such a distinguished audience. I will share my screen as I begin my presentation. I am Ho Jun Ho, the presidential candidate from the Basic Income Party of South Korea. Compared to candidate Lee Jae Myung, I am uh, pursuing and proposing a much more, uh, a larger basic income, a much more substantive uh, basic income. And my, uh, the title of my presentation is Sufficient Income for Substantive uh, Freedom. To introduce myself a little more, I am an author. I'm the author of the best-selling book in Korea entitled Basic Income Changes the World. And I've worked as the chief aide to National Assembly member Yong Hae-in of the Basic Income Party in crafting legislative bills on basic income. And I've also worked to realize basic income in Korea as a member of the uh, BIKN steering committee. The Basic Income Party, my party, is a new party founded in 2020. It is a youth party with 70% of party members in their 20s and 30s. It's a single issue party that focuses on the single agenda of basic income, but we also oppose all forms of discrimination and inequality. My party's basic income policies have four main principles. First, basic income is in itself a commons dividend. That is, profits made from common wealth shared by the society should be returned fairly to its members. Commons should include land, data, and radio frequency, and so on. And second, the principle of sufficiency. It is only when workers have sufficient income that they can wield bargaining power. By sufficient income, I mean at least higher than the livelihood benefits that the state provides the poor. And third, uh, two 
correctional taxes should be connected to basic income, carbon tax and land tax. These taxes are needed to respond to the climate crisis and resolve inequality. And fourth, the standard of the current welfare system must not be compromised. I will work to ensure that the introduction of basic income will mean income for the poor that is higher than what is being guaranteed by the current welfare system. And this is a time a table showing the budget and financial plan for my policies on basic income. The year 2023 is the year following the start of the presidential term of office, and 2026 is the last year of the five-year term. The bottom line shows that by the year 2023, 400,000 won or will be paid out every month, and 650,000 won by the year 2026. To finance this basic income, uh, special purpose or categorical taxes such as carbon tax, land tax, and citizen tax will be introduced, and uh, tax exemption or reduction will be abolished. And the revenue used for basic income as well. Uh, the tax and so tax reform would be essential. The tax burden for, for of Koreans is about 27% of the GDP, which is much lower than the 45% of France and 42% of Sweden. I will work to raise the tax burden to 38% of the GDP by 2026. And we will also need to increase the share of commons in digital and green industries. And this increase the this will increase the financial sources for uh, basic income. We need the new Green New Deal uh, to go carbon neutral and the Digital New Deal for digital transition. And we, and this will, uh, so the government will make uh, investment in these businesses and pay out the dividends as basic income. And this is a comparison of uh, Lee Jae-myung and my uh, basic income policies. And the biggest difference is that my plan is much closer to a sufficient basic income. Mr. Yi Jae-myung is offering a per capita per annum of 1 million won, or while my offer is about 7.8 million won. And while my emphasis is on basic income as a fair and just distribution of common dividends, Mr. Lee's emphasis is on basic income as a policy to boost consumption for economic growth. The size of the basic income offered by Mr. Lee is too small to realize the benefits of universal basic income. So it would be difficult to persuade the opposers of basic income. Furthermore, Mr. Lee has retreated from the strong determination to introduce basic income that he showed, that he used to show in the past, now that the presidential race has begun. And this change in attitude is one of the reasons I decided to run for president myself with basic income as my main uh, pledge. For your reference, uh, candidate Shim Sang Jung of the Justice Party, based on the labor movement, is also proposing uh, something uh, similar to the basic income in the form of the citizen minimum income guarantee. This is a modification of the negative income tax and it could contribute to wealth distribution, but it focuses on benefits for income earners lower than the median income. And this will end up dividing those who pay and those who benefit. So it's not a sustainable system. So depending on the results of the presidential elections, Korea could become the first ever country to establish a basic income, but we still have strong opposition to basic income among the Korean population. So we have a tough road ahead by proposing sufficient basic income policies and holding tough uh, policy debates with candidate Lee Jae-myung during the presidential campaign. I believe I can help uh, Korean citizens better understand and agree to basic income. I, Oh Jun ho and the Basic Income Party promise to do our very best to introduce basic income in Korea. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Oh Jun ho And uh, it's really, really fascinating to see the, the sheer density of uh, debate, the different kinds of proposals and the kind of thinking that has gone into different proposals. I think this is actually going to be not just uh, about this election, but I think it's going to be a contribution to the global discussion on actual 
proposals of implementing basic income. Thank you so much, Mr. Ho. And uh, now let's move on to uh, Professor Guy Standing. Uh, as you all know, most of you know, Professor Standing is one of the co-founders of Basic Income Earth Network, and now a uh, research professor at um, uh, SOAS, the School of uh, Orientals and African Studies in University of London. And the guy has been also part of several pilots all over the world. Guy, the floor is yours. Well, um, thank you very much. It's a very exciting time for Korea and for the rest of the world, but never before have we had two presidential candidates proposing variants of basic income. And I think those of us outside the country can only hope that they will not neutralize each other in fighting out over important, but details nevertheless. We need a, a coherent uh, vision of a better society. And I think that the South Korea is definitely a country where this could come about, partly because right back to its foundations in 2333 BC, the ethos of, of Hongik Ingan has been the guidance, the motto of the country. And the essence of that ethos has been living for community individuality in community and in solidarity. The Japanese uh, invasions and terrors uh, tried to dilute that ethos, but it hasn't succeeded. And I think that it's a very important principle that South Korea should be teaching the rest of the world at this instance. But there's a rare moment in history when a combination of adverse dangerous, threatening circumstances can precipitate a very positive transformational moment. Often in the past, it's been a war that's done that. Today, of course, in the world, we have a situation where before COVID struck, the world was extremely fragile. It was approaching an economic crisis, which I have written about in, under the term rentier capitalism, where more and more of the income was going to the owners of property, financial, physical, and intellectual property, and less and less was going to a growing precariat. And as a consequence of that system, we had unprecedentedly high rates of debt private household debt, corporate debt, and public government debt. And in 2019, we were seeing a situation of a bubble economy where a crash could have come at any moment. On top of that, that fragility, we have a situation of COVID, which of course has shown that the one thing we need in the world is resilience, a capacity to cope with setbacks and a capacity to deal with chronic uncertainty. And the third thing, of course, is that the world has suddenly, finally, woken up to the fact that we are faced by an ecological crisis where the threat of extinction and global warming is, is rushing towards us. This combination means that somebody as brave as the leading candidate in your presidential election has come out with a coherent transformational policy. And basic income is, of course, central to that policy. Other things around it are fantastic as well. And I've, I've studied the manifesto. It's a very exciting uh, manifesto. But basic income is the core. And I want to urge those who are advocating it in the country to focus on saying that basic income is justified as an ethical policy, as an ethical strategy based on three things. Common justice, the income and wealth of every Korean is due to all the efforts over the many generations over the period that I've just been talking about, creating the wealth. 
And it's been done through use of the commons. And the commons belong to everybody. And that justifies why we need to think about building up a commons fund funded by levies or taxes on use of the commons and distributing that equally to everybody. Now, so far, the candidates have suggested two forms of tax. One is a land value tax, and one can see the justification for that with the Gini coefficient and needing a, a, a good land value tax. The other, of course, is a carbon tax. And I think that all of us should support a carbon tax. But we know from examples around the world that there will only be support for a carbon tax if the government of the time guarantees that all the revenue from that carbon tax is recycled in the form of common dividends, because otherwise a carbon tax is regressive. But what I would urge the candidates to consider is don't put all the emphasis on those two levies or taxes. In my book, Plunder of the Commons, I come up with thinking that there should be something like 16 or 17 forms of levies on deductions for the commons, and that they should be put into the fund that's built up along the lines of the Norwegian pension fund, for example. And then as the fund goes up, you can pay out a bigger and bigger basic income or common dividend. But I think the building of that fund is a, th a thing that must be given more attention in the debates over the next couple of months. And in that case, I think you have to think about rolling back subsidies that governments have been giving out, which distort markets, and building other forms of levies. Frequent flyer levy, a use of the sea levy, something that doesn't put all the weight on those two funds. And I want to salute, by way of conclusion, the little island of Korea, called Django. Django has the distinction, I think, of having operated a basic income for longer than any other society. Its actual was set up in 1983. It came into effect in 1993. And today it pays out to every resident of Django something like $10,000 a year, I believe. I've been looking at all the data recently. And it's based on a principle of commoning as activity, shared activity, based on the humble sea cucumber. So that all the income from the sea cucumbers is put into the fund and redistributed, and now hated by clams. What has been a great example of that little island is that it has shown that it has strengthened solidarity it has strengthened the feeling of Hongik Ingan, and it has produced a lovely little society. And that small island is an exemplary case of how community can be rebuilt if South Korea has the wisdom to elect a president on March the 9th who will implement it. And all of us here, I think, hope and even pray that that will take place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Thank you for, for locating this particular manifesto and election in the larger big picture of what we are all um, worried about and concerned about. Now, I think uh, when I raise my hand, it means that you have 30 seconds. I know speakers will not have, will, would like not to look at my hand, but please look at my hand. Okay, thank you so much, um, Guy. And now let's quickly move to Hyosang An. Hyosang An, as most of you know, is the current chairperson of Basic Income Korea Network, which has played a significant role in all these years, last six, seven years, in bringing the situation to where it is today, bringing the basic income discussion to where it is today. And BIKN is really an example of what a national network should be doing to promote basic income. 
debate. And he's also, he's the chair. He's also the vice president of the Institute of Political and Economic Alternatives, Korea. Hyo san Hyo, five minutes. Yes, thank you very much. I'll be focusing on the uh, basic income manifesto of uh, candidate Lee Jae-myung and talk about the pathway to enable the introduction of basic income in Korea and the challenges uh, that we'll be facing uh, ahead of us and focusing on the characteristics of the overall political constellation in Korean society. There are several factors that led, led to the emergence of the basic income agenda in Korea. From a socioeconomic perspective, the basic income debate in Korea isn't that different from other countries. The deepening of income and wealth polarization, uh, lack of decent jobs, particularly among the youths, disruptive technological changes leading to a future without work are some of the aspects of the gloomy, gloomy future Koreans face. And I must add to this the climate crisis as well. But this does not mean that there is wide or strong support for basic income, although there is great in, greater interest and support thanks to the National Disaster, Emergency Disaster Relief Fund implemented in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the emergency basic income scheme of uh, Gyeonggi province, uh, where Jae Myung served as governor, recent polls suggest that the support for basic income is still not that high. Although also there aren't that many political or social groups among the labor, social or civil uh, movements that propose basic income as their main policy agenda. Of course, you have the basic income party with one seat in the National Assembly and also the basic income national movement driven by supporters of candidate Lee Jae Myung in the presidential campaign, but they are still the minority. Nevertheless, the, the possibility of introducing basic income into Korea has increased because the presidential candidate from the ruling party is pushing it as one of the main parts of his campaign pledge. Generally speaking, the Democratic Party is a center party that encompasses center right wing, and its presidential candidate, Lee Jae-myung, has positioned himself as a reformist with a progressive agenda that includes uh, basic income. The reasons for this was well explained uh, by Mr. Kang, so I don't think I need to elaborate any further. So what I'd like to explain in more detail in this discussion is the steady transformation of Korean politics, especially party politics. politics. Some of you might be reminded of uh, the Italian political scene in the 20th century because of the word transformation that I use. And this is indeed a strong trend in Korean politics as well. But what I mean by transformation here is that the major political parties in Korea have continued to embrace new political figures and policies since the democratization of movement of 1987 in order to strengthen uh, their influence. This is because the development of stable party politics had been hindered by the long period of dictatorship and repeated political upheavals. Furthermore, the Cold War and national division into North and South Korea blocked the establishment of left-wing parties. Uh, despite such circumstances, it was thanks to the people's aspirations for democracy that new and progressive agenda was able to find political expression and foothold in Korea. Through this process, Korea was able to build the framework to become a welfare state around the 2000s, and the national welfare system was expanded, albeit very slowly. And the dynamics of this welfare expansion is what drove the emergence of the basic income agenda. This is because although Korea is a late welfare state wanting to follow the existing principles of the welfare state, this pathway was disconnected from the actual socioeconomic uh, changes it was going through. And the reformist politicians who joined the catch-all party that, res that absorbed the center-right and conservatives were either assimilated into or marginalized from the mainstream. This is 
one of the main reasons for the lack of public confidence in politics and politicians in the Korean context. As can be assumed from my comments so far, although a reformist politician pushing for basic income has become the presidential candidate from the ruling party with a good chance at winning the presidential race, there are still huge challenges ahead when it comes to implementing basic income in Korea. There are forces opposing basic income both within and outside the ruling party and the social and civic movement that can put pressure on politicians are still not strong enough. So I think we can explore two possibilities under these circumstances. One would be garnering majority support, support from the majority for basic income through deliberation process, processes as proposed by the presenter. And the other is to respond to urgent policy tasks through basic income policies rather than approaching it as a generic basic income agenda. I'm talking specifically about policies such as land value tax for land dividends and carbon tax for carbon dividends. And these kind of uh, taxes is not against or is, is not incompatible with basic income. But in reality, even such taxes isn't going to be easy to complement. Needless to say, there will be strong resistance from the existing order and the so-called private asset seeking or rent seeking welfare is prevalent in Korean society right now. So the introduction of these two tax policies must become part of overall social and ecological transition and will be possible only when accompanied by other plans for comprehensive transformation. And this whole process should be a process that builds up an alliance for transformation. So basic income is important in and of itself, but it should also be a medium and a channel for building a much fairer and progressive uh, society. And so I would like to express my hope that we will uh, vote for a presidential president who will lead the way in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hyosang. I think uh, that was a really, really very, very valuable historical context that you have given as to how it has evolved, the idea has evolved. And uh, at the same time, also uh, being optimistic about this transformation. Let's move now to Valeria, Dr. Valeria Korasek. Uh, Dr. Valeria Korasek is a prominent economist from Slovenia and uh, well known in Europe. And she's a representative of Slovenian BN uh, group. And she's also the co founder of UBIE, uh, uh, Universal Basic Income Europe Network. Valeria, it's your five minutes. You're on mute, Valeria. Could you just, could you please unmute yourself? Yes. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. I hope you can hear me now. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the both Korean proposals, I would to say very kindly that both go somehow against the UBI design rules I promote and I will show you how I am doing and what uh, we are proposing. So first of all, I would like to say that Slovenia was the second best in European UB citizen initiative. It's far, um, it's uh, the best in the second one. It's also that in uh, COVID, as a part of anti-COVID measures, Slovenian government introduced uh, um, basic income in some way. So how that happened, how we got uh, and be so successful? I believe this is also because Slovenia has a very simple universal basic income proposal. It goes like that, 300 euros per month for all citizens. 
it is budget neutral. It's universal, of course, unconditional uniform, but it's basic. What does it mean? That means it's partial and it's only half of party threshold. But uh, it has to be shown in any proposal that with budget neutral UB uh, system, we can do better with the same amount of money we have to be able to make uh, child poverty lower, that uh, it's uh, better for the first and second seal for the most privileged, that uh, it's, uh, it makes smaller Gini coefficient. And of course, it has to be better for the majority of people. So what I would like to say is that the, the good and sound proposal has to go uh, along with social values adjustments and some pragmatic solutions regarding fiscal uh, and economic uh, policy. So in Slovenia, we did some, uh, some social adjustments and afterwards we came to the solution that it's like 17 points from 20 from ideal. So we don't have ideal proposal, but it's still the good enough that it makes us the best in Europe. So if we are going to talk about Korean, I would like to ask only uh, such question. Can you show us how it would be work if it would be budget neutral? And if it can be budget neutral. So the, the next question is, is it uh, uh, simple to understand? Is it simple to implement? Uh, and of course, as I said, criteria, does it uh, benefit the majority and it's good for the most the privileged? Uh, the main suggestion is also having in mind that the first UBI proposal should not take a lot of effort in changing legislation. In Slovenian case, we said, well, let's not uh, change uh, tax rate. Let's not change social contributions. Just make, let's do the a social welfare system, easier to understand, simple, transparent, and make people uh, have a feeling that our society is just for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. I think uh, you saved 12 seconds. Uh, your presentation. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. I th uh, thank you for bringing it, uh, bringing another case for a comparative uh, discussion and uh, raising some very stimulative questions. And I think budget neutrality is, is a is a big uh, question for debate. I think uh, I will now. Let's move on to the next speaker, Ali Mutlu Koi 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 Gulu. Uh, Dr. Ali uh, is the co-founder of Citizens Basic Income Research Development Culture and Dissemination Society and co-founder of the worldwide meetings of UBI advocates and UBI networks. And he's from Turkey. He's from Turkey. Ali, the floor is yours. You have five minutes. I can't see Ali uh, in the group. Ali, are you there? Okay, I think some network issue maybe. I think let's move on to the next speaker and Ali can join in later. Uh, let's move to Philippe, uh, Philippe Van uh, Philippe, as most of you know, is uh, one of the leading thinkers on basic income and he's, uh, we have learned so much from his books. And he's also the co-founder of uh, Basic Income Earth Network. And he's the uh, chair of the, uh, I can't 
speak the French word, but I think he's in university or Catholic University of De Louvain in Belgium. Uh, uh, Philippe, I would waste your time. Now it's your five minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll start by congratulating both uh, political attempts to realize uh, uh, basic income or to promote the idea of basic income in the Korean uh, context. Uh, they are very different, these two attempts, uh, but both, I think, uh, are meaningful. In the case of a single issue uh, basic income party, of course, the main task and uh, the, the usefulness consists in uh, putting pressure on the more established parties and in publicizing uh, the ideas throughout uh, the electorate. For uh, a party which has, it seems, a real potential of being elected and uh, the, of getting to power and uh, uh, certainly the ambition to do so, uh, there uh, the usefulness is of course different because there we are talking not just about promoting the idea but, uh, but about uh, realizing it. And as soon as one talks about realizing it, of course one must uh, think about steps, about gradually moving uh, to in that direction. Certainly, I believe that uh, child benefits, universal child benefits are a meaningful, important step. And the idea of starting from the older children is an original uh, version, uh, provides an original version of that uh, proposal, of that uh, a step, transitional step, which is definitely worth thinking about. Also, providing everyone with a basic pension is an essential, important step that in my view is uncontroversial. I'm more skeptical or have more reservations about the idea of a basic income, universal basic income for the young, uh, because it misleadingly suggests that uh, it is really in this initial period of life that the essential uh, investment in human capital needs to be done, when I think it's very essential, very important today to think that this investment must happen uh, throughout life. But who am I as an outsider to advise you, the Koreans, in detail about the best way of uh, getting closer to the ideal of a significant basic income for everyone? This res reservation also holds for the ways in which you propose to fund the basic income. In particular, the land tax. The land tax, as you know, uh, there are some objections to it. Why focus on one form of assets, one form of wealth, which is land versus uh, other forms of assets in terms of shares? Uh, there will be, there may be both economic objections to this specific targeting of wealth as well as is ethical issues that are being raised. But uh, what I have no doubt about is the meaningfulness of the carbon tax. This holds for Korea but this holds for all of us in all our countries. It's important for pragmatic reasons, but it's also very important for symbolic reasons because we need to tie in a very visible way the cause of basic income with the big fight that awakes, that awaits us in the coming decades in order to address the challenge of climate change. And this, um, uh, it, but this is only one way in which we must tie uh, the issue of basic income with the issue of climate change and indeed the other challenges we'll have to face, not least uh, the pandemic. Some of our freedoms will need to be restricted and legitimately so if we are going to, address, to be able to address the challenge of climate change and uh, the uh, challenge of this pandemic and the later pandemics. But it is important that at the same time, we should be able to tell the younger generations that their well-being and indeed their freedom can be increased if it is increased in other dimensions, and in particular through the uh, important uh, real freedom dimension that is related to basic uh, income uh, security. We must today sell basic income, universal basic income, not as a recipe for a dolce vita, for enjoying, for everyone to enjoy a, a, a leisure full time and resting on the rents of uh, past development. But we must uh, sell it, we must defend it as an intelligent way of mobilizing all of us, our societies, our populations, 
in order to face the challenge, the challenges ahead in a sustainable way. This mobilization, and this is crucial, does not involve pushing everyone into full-time paid work. And as you know, in Korea, full-time work is particularly heavy, it's particularly long hours. No, uh, we must not, that's not what this mobilization uh, can, uh, uh, can best happen through the fear of starvation, through the anguish of extreme poverty. It, uh, this mobilization must rather involve providing basic security and thereby liberating people's energy, liberating their creativity, including the people who are most uh, vulnerable. It must involve the facilitation, which is central in the effect, the economic effect of basic income, facilitating a back and forth, an, uh, an easy back and forth between employment, education in the broader sense, and then voluntary activities, which are also non-paid activities, which are also very important for the sustainable, for sustainably addressing the challenges ahead. And to put it briefly and to close, and so what we need to, to, to sell basic income as is really as a productive force. The real freedom it gives to all is a productive force that we absolutely need if we are going to address the challenges, uh, the challenges ahead. This, of course, holds for all countries in the world, as it does for Korea. But I think that the current presidential campaign in Korea, whatever the result, provides us with a fantastic opportunity to make millions of people aware of the way in which a basic income can be at the core of our, uh, of our uh, real realistic um, effort to make our societies more resilient, as Guy puts it, and at the same time more able to address these enormous challenges which worldwide are awaiting us. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. You gave that positive twist about how to see a basic income policy as a productive and an intelligent way of mobilization. Often we tend to, when we are making proposals, we tend to be defensive about it and try to please the critiques or those who attack the idea. I think this is a very, very positive tone. It adds the positive tone. And thanks for bringing the idea of freedom and work and leisure related questions around basic income. Now let's move to Carl, since I still don't see Ali here. Maybe he has uh, connection issues. Um, Carl, uh, all of you know, Carl uh, has been uh, in various roles. He's a professor of philosophy at University of Georgetown and uh, in, based in Qatar. But at the moment, Carl is in Germany at Freebies, Freiburg Institute of Basic Income Studies. But I think Carl has also played several roles. I will not go into it. And he's one of the most vocal advocates of basic income. Carl, your five minutes. Thank you, Saraf. Uh, I uh, I want to talk about what well, uh, I'll I want to talk about several things. I'll see how much I can get in in five minutes. First, about the land tax, the land and carbon tax proposal, and about uh, Nam Hoon's presentation of it. Uh, first, about his about your presentation, uh, Na, um, Nam Hoon. Um, I think one one big important thing uh, was, was someone could figure out by by what you said, but but it would be more helpful if you would tell them that. And that is this: most Korean landowners will benefit from this land tax. Not just the majority of people, not just ninety percent of people, but also a substantial majority of landowners themselves will benefit from something that taxes landowners and shares with everybody. Um, and I think you should calculate the exact percentage of landowners that you predict will benefit from this and explain why. And of course, they benefit because land ownership in Korea, like so many places, is so unequal that people at the high end are uh, own most of the land. And actually, if you are if you are just own your home, at least if it's a uh, if 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 you own a home except for one of the richest homes there is, um, you're going to 
you're going to be a net recipient of this redistribution from a land tax. And so, so that, because what they will try to do, those wealthy landowners will try to get the, the, the small landowners say, this is against us, all 60% of us in this country, it's, it's us against those non-land, those non-landowners are probably to take from us. Well, no, the, the small landowners have, have to know that they are a part of the them in this, and that 90% of the population benefits includes something like, I don't know what it is, 60, 70, 80% of the landowners in Korea. That's really important. Um, now, uh, uh, um, now, another thing about the, I, I love this proposal. I love this proposal for reasons, uh, partly that Guy said about it links it to the commons. And, and Philippe talked about this as well as others. It links the UBI to the commons, which is so important. Our common assets have been plundered again and again and again. Um, they're taking more and more of things that don't belong naturally to anyone, and they interfere with us and harm the rest of us when they do so, and they've never paid back. It's time they need to pay back. Um, I think you know, land taxes are needed anyway to stem, to stem the, the speculative rise in land values, which also hurts small landowners as much as everybody else. Um, and pairing UBI with land taxes makes both of them work better because the UBI, it, UBI then won't get eroded by increased speculation of land prices and um, uh, prices, of, prices of land and things like that won't get passed on to other people uh, with UBI. So um, it, will, it will protect the real value of UBI. Oh, wow, my auto town already. Uh, it'll help just. No, no, no. Sorry, you. sorry oh. for the mistake, Carl. It was a mistake. Uh, and it will help justify UBI by making this commons-based case for it, and help gather support for it. And I think it's similar with the carbon tax that it's badly needed anyway. And the carbon tax works much better if you recycle that income by putting it back into the economy. If you only tax, uh, if you only tax carbon. Um, Philip mentioned, or Philippe or Guy, somebody mentioned that is that is regressive, but that's not the biggest problem. The, I think the biggest problem with only taxing carbon is that it is it is it is a huge drag on the economy. It's a huge. Uh, if you only tax carbon and don't put that money back, you're really putting the brakes on a lot of economic activity. If you take money out from carbon use and put it back in in UBI, you're essentially making things that use carbon more expensive and everything else relatively less expensive. So the total amount of economic activity doesn't go down at all. Um, so it's, it's, it's a much better macroeconomic policy if you're putting that money back in. That helps justify UBI. If you're being taxed, you're being fined for being above average uh, polluter. And if you're if you're a net recipient of UBI, you are being rewarded for being a below average polluter. It really helps justify UBI and gather support for it. My biggest complaint with this proposal is you could go farther. Land is not the only shared resource. We have so many others. We have the broadcast spectrum. We have mining rights. We have water rights. Um, we, have, uh, we have created uh, common spaces such as such as the internet, which most, which most of the revenue from that goes to a few big companies. Uh, we have a government which creates a central bank that then is almost is in most countries is like a selfless support for the bank, the profits of bankers rather than the people. We need to have we need to have a UBI based on all of these common assets, not not just this. Uh, not just this, and all pollutants, not just carbon. Carbon is a terrible pollutant, but we have lots and lots of other pollutions. You can so build on this model if you step out from these two things um, to really the rest of the commons. And I have, I have plenty of sources uh, that can, that can uh, help you find these, uh, help, help you find some of these things. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you so much for really highlighting the commons issue. I think that is really, really an important thing. And I, since I don't see Ali, I think Ali has problems with network. 
I think that's where I close. Uh, I think we can now open it for, we are doing well with time. I can now open for questions from the participants. Uh, yes, Annie, or anybody else, we take two minutes before we open for questions. Yes, Annie, you have to say something. I just want to point out one thing. People have been talking about 60% of the population are landowners. No, they're not. 60% of households. And there are a lot of people in those households are not landowners. For instance, if there is a home, is, if there is a farm, is it owned by all the adults or just by one male landowner? And if... Uh, there could be a majority of people who are not landowners, if you take them by individuals, not by households, who are very much in favour of a redistributive effect. So please don't confuse household and individuals where votes, votes are relevant. I just wanted to make that point, especially where women are concerned, because a lot of them will be excluded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Valeria? Yes, uh, I believe I will go uh, along with any comments uh, about uh, land taxes and carbon taxes. Well, let's imagine that we have a nation without land and without uh, carbon industry. Well, we will still need basic income. So it's very important that we start something which brings the idea of solidarity and uh, basic income as a floor for every and each uh, person in society to feel equal. So uh, that's why I believe it, uh, it should start from the, the smaller, smaller scale of UBI. I would say that would be much better and why to attack the feelings, you know, of the people uh, who are attached to those lands and having them scared with uh, the idea. That's why I said uh, I propose smaller amount at the beginning and be, and be modest. Basic income people are modest, I believe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. Okay, we can, take a, we can take a little more time if other panelists would like to respond or uh, would like to contribute, say something um, in response to other panelists. Uh, we're most welcome. You can raise your hand. Yeah, Carl. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I did want to say something about the Korean the Korean situation. Um, I think it's interesting that we have front mainstream candidate and then this, this one issue party, uh, both pushing basic income. Uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna emphasize the symbiosis between, between these because usually the mainstream candidate, when they start, are going to be, are going to be compromising away a lot, of, a lot of what us true believers believers want. However, as Valeria said, you know, starting small is, well, uh, well, she didn't say it like this, but I think st something is better than nothing. Starting small is better than starting with nothing. Uh, and uh, we need to start with something. By having, having, the, having this new party uh, pushing a, a fuller basic income and, and pushing this as primary importance, they make the mainstream proposal look moderate and therefore more acceptable to most to to the average person but they also at the same time can use their leverage to try to push them to a more ambitious proposal uh, so and by the fact that the mainstream is pushing a smaller version of what you're pushing they also help you look less radical by saying well okay it's a, it's a stronger version of this this mainstream thing so in in, in a way the two things the two things help each other, despite the fact that we're always going to feel like those those mainstream people sold us out. Okay, Mr. Juno O first, and then Guy. Yes, ah, 기본소득당 예 오준호 대통령 후보입니다. 패널께서 yes, I'm Ojuno of the Basic Income Party. Ah. Uh, 
many people have made that suggestion that there will be uh, because of the competition on basic income between uh, candidate Lee Jae Myung and me, uh, people are expressing concern uh, that this will actually uh, make it even more un unclear or complicated uh, to voters. But I don't think so. I do understand uh, the philosophy, the basic income related philosophy of Mr. Lee. And on my part, I believe uh, that Mr. Lee has to make, uh, ex uh, to explain how he'll be financing the basic income in a very clear and uh, transparent way. And as was well explained by the presenter, how will these policies and these plans be actually implemented uh, there needs to be further elaboration on that from candidate Lee. And so that is what I will be aiming for. What kind of objectives we will be able to attain through basic income and how we will be financing uh, basic income. I'll be making these explanations very clear. And I believe uh, that we have made a contribution as a, a political party to the debate on basic income. About 300 uh, seats. There are about 300 seats in the National Assembly and the ruling party uh, takes up the majority, more than half of the seats, uh, more than 180. Uh, but uh, regarding uh, basic income, there was only one bill that was actually uh, tabled, uh, proposed, officially proposed by the ruling party so the land value tax or the carbon tax or the commons tax. These are still waiting, awaiting. And it is the basic income party that has been uh, in this lonely fight uh, to table this, all these uh, bills in the uh, National Assembly. So we are playing a very important role already. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ojuno. Uh, yeah, Guy, uh, you had a question. Yeah, well, I know it's a point I'd like to add to the Commons debate, taking up something that Carl and others mentioned. If we're building a, a Commons approach to basic income, then I think one has to realize there are three types of Commons on which one could make levies or taxes. One we've been talking about, which is a land value tax. A land is a resource which is non-exhaustible in a sense. And so if you've got the land value tax, you could redistribute that. But there are other forms of commons which are exhaustible, including minerals in the ground or oil or forests, as Rahul has mentioned in a, in a, in a Q&A point which I, with which I agree. And these are exhaustible. And therefore, if you raise revenue from a levy on those uses of the commons, you must preserve the capital value for future generations. That's the principle of intergenerational equity. Otherwise, it's unfair to give a windfall gain to the current generation and deprive future generation of access to commons resources. And I think that that needs to be uh, differentiated from replenishable uh, uh, resources, which include the forests. I think there should be a commons levy on profit making from our forests. And, and Korea, like many other countries, is rich, is rich in forests. But you need to use part of the revenue that you would put on that for replenishing the forests and therefore not redistribute or recycle all the revenue. So I think the fund has to be built up on, on principles of how you use the money that's raised, be invested and part of the return given out in form of basic income and the building of a fund 
for the future as well as the present. And I think that principle is something we all should be emphasizing. And I think the debate in, in Korea in this presidential election, my guess it will move in that direction. So to put less weight on carbon and land, even though these are important sources of revenue, and spread it around so that the sources of income can be uh, mobilized on a wider basis. And, and that is rather exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Guy. Uh, I think now we'll open uh, to the questions from the participants and I don't see any hands raised. So in the meantime, may I ask uh, maybe if Professor Kang or Hyo Sang would like to respond to the questions uh, or the issues raised by Mr. Ojuno briefly. Would you like to or should we pass to the participants? Well, I can speak later, I think. Okay. I'll okay. talk later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I saw Eduardo raising his hand. Eduardo, would you like to speak? Uh, I, don't know where I, should. I think you should raise your hand again, Eduardo, in the meantime. I will allow Andy Abbott to speak, make his question. Hey there, can you hear me all right? Yes, Andy, go on, go ahead. Um, it's Andy. just one that I put in the Q&A there, but I was interested that the one of the categories or the categorical basic incomes in the manifesto, um, as well as for disabled peoples, for artists, um, that that was under discussion, uh, under discussion. So I was just wondering what, what the discussion's been there. Uh, and then also how um, they might imagine the category or role of artist transforming in a society that offers universal basic income. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, who would like to answer, Mr. Ojuno or Kang, Professor Kang or Yosan? Who would like to answer this question? Yeah, yeah, check out more. All right. Uh, th this is a simple question, so let me give you a brief answer. So when it comes to the uh, disabled uh, basic income, uh, the current system uh, is uh, allowances are given to uh, people with disabilities uh, based on the different levels of disability uh, in the disabled basic income is just to add uh, additional uh, allowances uh, for them, which would be the equal amount for everyone. So uh, strictly speaking, it is not really basic income, but additional allowances for people with disabilities. When it comes to artist uh, basic income, uh, there is a registry of artists in Korea. Uh, and the purpose of it is to provide some government support. Uh, in as we are seeing more and more artists suffering uh, in the pandemic, the idea is to uh, give uh, the same amount uh, to artists. Uh, this idea is under review as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Khan. Uh, Eduardo, you can speak now. I'm allowing you to talk. Eduardo, go ahead, ask your question. Could you please mute, mute, unmute yourself? Eduardo. He's got his question up. Okay. He's got his question up on the Q&A. Okay, Eduardo. How about the possibility of having uh, UBI in South and North Korea in the near future? Anybody would like to take this question? Briefly, anybody would like to answer that? Professor Kang? Carl would... Yeah, if, if none of the Koreans want to talk... Will this, let uh, me a... answer? Oh, yeah, yeah. So Korean should take... Sure, sir. Yeah, go ahead. So in 1992, 
South and North Korea became members of the United Nations at the same time. So with that uh, critical event, the relations, inter-Korean relations uh, have become uh, the relations between countries and at the same time, the relations within a same nation. So this is a very special type of relation. And uh, realistically, there is uh, very little possibility for the two Koreas uh, being unified in the near future. And what's more important is to have peaceful relations uh, between the two countries or the two parts of the same nation. And in the process of building peaceful relations, maybe we can consider universal basic income as a policy measure for that. However, as you may well know from the media, the inter-Korean relations now are very tense. However, we can, I think, uh, consider that as an idea for peaceful coexistence uh, between South and North Korea. Thank you. Thank you, Hosang. Uh, yes, Carl. Uh, I would say on, the, on this point, even though it's not, it's not going to happen, it's not likely to happen soon, the, the possibility of, of a U Korean reunification is, is an excellent example of, of how of how an economy works so poorly without UBI and works so much better with UBI. Imagine that if, if, if Korea unified, North Korea collapsed tomorrow and Korea was unified, um, what would happen without, without a UBI? Millions of North Koreans would come south looking for work because that's where the jobs are. They would come south looking for work. There would be no housing they could afford. There would be rampant homelessness. They would bid down wages of, of people who are already there, which is, which is also make it more expensive for them to live and be able to afford housing. But if we introduced a UBI, if, if UBI at the same time tomorrow when we're imagining North Korea collapses, um, then there's a UBI, everybody in the North has money. Instead, companies come North. They have a, they have a reason to go, uh, companies would not go North very, very quickly with no UBI up there because nobody has any money to spend. You give every single North Korean some money to spend and you give every South Korean company a reason to open a store in every little town to send these people, which also is gonna push up their employment. And it's going to be uh, going to be make it possible to create other sorts of industries up there. The economy works better with UBI, and just thinking about Korean unification is is one of the best examples I can think to show that. Absolutely, absolutely wonderful, Carl. That's a very very optimistic note. Uh, anybody else, Mr. Ojuno, would you like to say anything, or we will move to the next questioner? Shall I move on? Yeah, Ms. Ojuno, yeah, go ahead. Yes, allow me to make a simple and brief comment on the suggestion by uh, Professor Carl. If there is a sudden uh, reunification between North and South Korea, if that is a ki the kind of scenario uh, that comes to us overnight, then uh, yes, that would be a very good suggestion. And actually it's all the more reason we have to be working very hard to establish and introduce a basic income here in Korea. But what I'd like to say here is that in realistically speaking, we are very much concerned about uh, absorption or reunification by absorption uh, or very sudden uh, reunification. Uh, but whatever the case, for to ease the way for uh, uh, unification, uh, that is another reason we have to work hard for basic income. Thank you, Mr. Ojuno. I think that's, 
that's a very, very important uh, issue. I think we are hoping that, first of all, basic income will be implemented in South Korea. And then I think when unification happens, I think all Koreans will get a basic income. Now I will move on to Peter Knight, the next question. Peter, I'm allowing you to speak. Yeah. Yes, Peter, go ahead. Uh, could you please unmute yourself? Yeah. I just did. Uh, my question has to do with um, what has been the impact in the media and the discussion in the media, the print and electronic media um, of this, uh, of, the, of the two manifestos. Has there been any impact in the media and is the discussion going on prior to the election on the subject more broadly? Yeah, who would like to take this question? Uh, Professor Kang? Uh, All right. So far, the print and broadcast media are covering basic income more often than usual because they focus a lot on the uh, presidential race. However, the Korean media uh, raises voices for the rich or the ruling class. So most of the media uh, are critical uh, about basic income. So that is one of the reasons why we are thinking about a deliberative discussion uh, to overcome the hurdle of the established media who work for the rich. Uh, but the positive side is that Korea uh, has had some experiences of uh, basic income in the current pandemic. So there have been a couple of um, grants uh, or uh, dividends um, provided for uh, people. In once uh, it was for all Koreans. Uh, and in this case, uh, the uh, support, financial support was given in local currency. Uh, the local currency in this case can be used only in uh, the city you live in, for example, and on, only uh, for uh, premises with uh, 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 with uh, the uh, sales uh, less than a, thir a certain threshold. So uh, the local currency uh, financial support uh, was very effective uh, for supporting the uh, small uh, shop owners and the self-employed. Uh, this was felt uh, by many Koreans, uh, but the established media is still critical about it. Let me add a few more comments to answer some of the questions raised so far. So there was a question uh, from Annie. Uh, or comment, 40% um, of the households, not people, own no land. And now the land value tax will be imposed uh, to homeowners who only own an apartment because uh, there will be a certain certain uh, size of land attached uh, to that uh, apartment. And when it comes to farmland and forests, there are uh, property tax uh, existing already. Uh, and we are thinking uh, about not adding more uh, taxes uh, to the existing ones uh, for them. Uh, Valeria talked about carbon tax uh, as 
a source that will disappear when we reach carbon neutrality. So this is not a stable uh, source for basic income. So if we succeed in achieving carbon neutrality, I believe the carbon dividend will increase by 2040 and start to decrease uh, from that. And after 2050, uh, the carbon dividend will be minimal. But of course, uh, it's not bad uh, to see carbon dividend uh, disappearing because it has served uh, the purpose of making the earth uh, much better and greener. And as many have raised the possibility, we can think of other uh, sources uh, such as plastics and other uh, polluting sources and other types of commons. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kang. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm now Young Siok CEO. Uh, Mr. Ojono, you would like to respond to that? Please go ahead. Please go ahead. After that, we can have Young uh, ask his question. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I would like to respond to the question posed by uh, Peter, and then th that's why I raised my hand. Uh, what is the uh, opinion of or the uh, attitude of the media when it comes to basic income? Actually, they're quite hostile. Uh, the Korean media, the press are quite hostile uh, when it comes to the concept of basic income. But if the presidential campaign it can be run at a point in time when uh, the presidential candidate that is pushing for basic income uh, has enough chances uh, to actually win, then I believe that it will be very possible uh, to make the case for and uh, Korea becoming the first uh, country to introduce uh, the basic income. But the rationale at the moment is based on justice, that because we have limited wealth uh, and property, it is uh, it's one of the ways that uh, the basic income uh, policy is criticized is that uh, since we have very small resources, uh, limited resources, uh, wouldn't it be more effective to focus this on the, those who need it more instead of making this a universal uh, basic income? That is one of the ways uh, that is criticized. And another um, suggestion or alternative that is tabled is that it should focus on beefing up, we should be focusing on beefing up the welfare system. And even supporters of the basic income are uh, try, uh, um, make suggestions about introducing basic income through the back door, so to speak, uh, undercover. Uh, so the debate over basic income is really quite complicated. Uh, and but as was and as was put by uh, suggested by uh, Mr. Kang, uh, he suggested starting small and taking incremental steps. But then that will give the critiques from uh, an even stronger voice. So I think uh, although there will be a very big burden from the from the at the beginning uh, we should start by giving out a sufficient basic income from the very beginning and that is my proposal and that's what makes distinguishes my proposal from Mr. Lee's. I, I would like to just uh, maybe ask one of the panelists or one or two to respond to this question of uh, 
uh, starting small, better than nothing uh, position to only high enough or sufficient. What do you all think of Philippe or Guy or, yeah, Guy and Valeria, yes. Yes, Guy first and then Valeria, be brief, please. Um, I've, always, I've always been in favor of making sure we're on the road towards a decent basic income. And I think that in pragmatic terms, it has to start at, at the low level and, and pitch it as a common dividend. A dividend on the collective wealth is something that can express it in a different way from and get away from the welfare issues, but move towards a, a sufficient level in the longer term. But I think we have to move pragmatically, and that, that's why I favor hybrid. And essentially, in this context of COVID, which we've hardly talked about, COVID means that the resilience of society will depend on the resilience of all of us. And the essence of a basic income is to provide us with basic security, which is a public good and which can be understood as something that we all need. And we won't get it through means testing or targeting or building up selective categorical schemes. We need it all as a basis. And I think that's a better way of put, pitching it. Yeah, thank you, Guy. Valeria? And after well, that, I'll go to Philip. Yes, thank you. Well, going along, uh, of course, COVID was the best lesson. It, uh, it uh, teached us that everyone needs help. Everyone can need help, no matter how, how good artist is uh, or it was. But uh, I would also like to suggest um, that uh, going away from welfare state, yes. But in most countries, there is a strong effort to, ma to make more efficient state more efficient administration. And that was always my uh, target uh, going with uh, UBI because I'm like technocrat UBI, I'm not idealist. And, uh, but also my proposal went uh, in direction that we can reach basic income in a year. You know, talking about what can we achieve in 10 years, 20 years of dreaming, something but it's not like uh, what I'm uh, making with uh, proposal and um, UB design rules. Thank you. Thank you Valeria. Yeah Philip and after that Carl. Yes uh, so to me too it's obvious that if you want to realize it you won't realize it through a big jump by having in one go uh, basic income that is sufficient uh, to live uh, even if you are on your own and you live in, in, in the middle of the capital city. So we'll have to move gradually, point one. Point two, but there are many ways of moving gradually. And it's uh, useful to draw lessons from the most recent French presidential election, where you also had a candidate who put basic income at the center of his program and who was the candidate for the ruling party, for the president who was then in, uh, in power. Uh, so that was Benoit Hamon uh, being the candidate for the Socialist Party at the time when François Hollande was uh, also from the Socialist Party, was the president of France. And it led to a disaster, to an electoral disaster. He won the primaries for the left, but then uh, the election itself, which was won you know, by Emmanuel Macron, uh, was a disaster. But what, and this was no doubt for a number of reasons that have nothing to do with basic income. But basic income had something to do with it because on advice of the advice of Thomas Piketty and uh, Thomas Piketty's uh, uh, partner who was, uh, they were both uh, his uh, economic advisors, he thought that in order to convince a larger part of the French electorate, it was important not to present it as a universal basic income, but uh, without calling it that as a negative income tax. And so Thomas Piketty said, we shouldn't use that phrase, that no, but what he was proposing was that he called it a just wage because as a result of the introduction of this sort of universal tax credit, the wage of the people on the lowest wages would go up in net terms as a result of it being introduced. But then it looked as if 
this proposal of universal basic income was not only budget neutral, uh, as I uh, advocated earlier, but it was it looked even like a, a, a reduction in taxation because there would be a reduction, an increase in the net wage of uh, the worst off, and then people stopped understanding. <laughs> so that my my second point is really there are various ways of moving forward, but it's important that these steps forward should remain intelligible to the electorate. And that leads to my third point is that. Although you may proceed in these various ways, uh, age-based, uh, category-based, if the distinction between rural and urban population or between farmers and non-farmers is not too contentious, you may want to move forward in these various ways. Above all, you will want to move forward with a modest level of basic income. Um, but uh, it's important at the same time to keep the ideal of a more generous basic income as a perspective. And of course, generous is uh, relative, but if you look at the, the, the result of the Finnish experiment, you had 560 euros per person and per month, the same as what the people got on social assistance, but the fact that it was given in an unconditional way reduced considerably the level of stress of the people, the way in which they look to the future, and the way in which, therefore, they could mobilize their capacities in the service of whatever needs doing. So we need to move uh, and to move slowly, that is uh, in a prudent way, but at the same time, not lose uh, the sight of this more utopian aim, which won't be realized in one big leap, but uh, it's combining these things that is sometimes difficult, but essential. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. It's really, this is fascinating. Keeping in view the utopia, I think one should prudently move forward. I think that's, yes, Carl. Yes, uh, the, the, the starting, I, I, I'm never gonna, gonna turn down an incremental step because getting money into the hands of people suffering really should be our top priority. And it can work out as a step to the, to the long run, but for, to what we want in the long run. However, um, However, it, it, if it's going to happen, it needs to be part of a vision. If we know that there's this UBI model out there and we only got a piece of it, um, then we can see, we can see this as, is, as we can see this little piece as a movement there. But we, shouldn't, we should not forget that it is possible to make the big leap. In the 1930s, the United, the United States introduced a near universal livable pension system across the country almost overnight with very little advanced movement, uh, broad-based political movement for it. Before that, it is possible that you get big changes quickly. And also incremental steps, if they're not part of that vision of what it is, often become out as gimmicky and, and seem to have nowhere to go and are, and are the most easily attacked thing. Uh, one excellent example of this is the baby bond that was introduced by the in the waning days of the labor government in the 2000s in the UK, they had this tiny little, we're gonna give, gonna give babies a little bit of money, which they'll be able to, we'll put it in a fund, it'll grow for 18 years, and then they'll get that and the interest on it 18 years from now, starting it only with newborn children. So it had no constituency. Uh, so when the, the conservative government got in in coalition with uh, with that middle of the road group, what's their name? Uh, that was one of the first things they cut because it had no vision and no constituency. If, if you're gonna take an inter incremental step, it's gotta be part of the vision and it's gotta be something that's gonna build a constituency for, uh, for a true UBI. Thank you, thank you, Carl. Uh, yes, a quick intervention. We have actually crossed our time limit, but I'm taking liberties. I know all of you have to get back. We will close in another five minutes. Those who have, of you who have written down questions, I'm sorry, I'm not able to read and continue like this. Please raise your hand and I, we can get a chance for you to speak. Yes, Annie, briefly, and after that we move to Annie. I'm so sorry, Young, you are there. I think after this, Young will speak. Yes, Annie, go ahead. 
I just want to endorse the fact that if you if you introduced a full basic income in one go, it would be very disruptive. There'd be inflation, there'd be shortages of um, things that uh, people with newly acquired incomes would need, and uh, there'd be all sorts of problems. And there are advantages in introducing it in stages, but uh, well known in advance what they are. And that is that people can get used to them but also the losers can get used to their grief and realize that it's actually okay. And in a paper I'm preparing at the moment for basic income in an independent Scotland, I start with getting rid of all the tax reliefs in the system because the UK has an enormously leaky tax, um, uh, leaky tax income tax system. And if you stop the leaks, you could actually have a decent amount to redistribute. Um, but then uh, I, then start with the level of basic income, which is greater than the means tested benefit levels for a single person, because then I avoid all the problems of integration with the current benefit system. Not all the problems, but certainly the ones to do with the means tested benefit system. So you can work things out to get the minimum disruption if you think about it carefully, but you need a good knowledge of your current social security system, your income tax system, all your taxes, in fact, and in fact, to you know all your. Um, uh, all your um, commons to go towards a, a social welfare function. Um, anyway, that's just what I wanted to say. You need some staging in this. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. We will have Young ask his question. I don't know. I think I can only see Peter. I think, Peter, your question will be last unless that is already answered. You said something like MMT. We'll come to that. Yes, Mr. Young, I'm so sorry. I kept you waiting. Go ahead with your question. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I would like to thank you, the panel, from uh, of renowned, uh, world renowned uh, uh, intellectuals and scholars. I'm a member of the National Assembly. And in Korean, uh, there's a Korean saying that uh, starting, the beginning is half the road traveled. And and uh, you, thank you. So I'd like to thank you for, uh, for providing me with more grounds uh, to support my uh, opinion or a position that we can start small and make incremental uh, changes towards more substantive or sufficient uh, basic income. And in order to create the kind of community uh, that we want, uh, basic income has to be one of the cornerstones. And one thing I'd like to emphasize is uh, methods for feasible methods for financing. Uh, the uh, financing basic income. And so my question is, has the taxing of renewable energy ever been uh, considered uh, in the debate on uh, financing uh, social, uh, basic income? So that's a question that, that I'd like to pose to the panelists before I close. Yeah, who would like to take it? Thank you, Young. Thank you so much, Mr. Young. Uh, who would like to take the question? I don't see anybody. So, yeah. Philip? Yeah, I can add, uh, if the question is, has it ever been proposed or even implemented in the world? And the answer is yes. A number of countries have introduced at least a basic universal pension funding it with, uh, 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 sorry, but now I, I got, was it with non-renewable or with renewable resources? With renewable, renewable, if it's, yeah. So because with non-renewable, some countries have done it like Bolivia and Mongolia, but of course we're using the returns on the, the sale of natural resources. And that is of course unsustainable. But if it's about a uh, renewable resource, well, you can say both that, uh, as was mentioned before, that land is, uh, uh, is uh, a renewable resource. It's always there if you treat it uh, properly. And so you could say that uh, giving each 
a person, uh, a part of the rent on, or the value of land is one way of funding that. But even um, the CO2 tax can be regarded as a, a fee that you pay for access to the sustainable absorption capacity of the atmosphere. We all have an equal right to that, and that is renewable if you treat it properly, if you don't exceed a certain uh, threshold. It's not that uh, zero carbon emission uh, is uh, uh, what is needed even for the long term. There has never been zero carbon uh, emission even before mankind appear on the surface of the, of the Earth. So these are two examples. Uh, but uh, several others have been mentioned during this conversation. Yeah, anybody else? Thank you, Philip. Uh, Carl, yeah. Yeah, the question is about uh, renewables, uh, uh, you know, renewable sources of energy. Then uh, I think most, most places are so uh, concerned about, about, about promoting uh, renewable forms of energy that they they don't want to slow that down with taxing them. Once they're established, it might be easier to do that. However, if you've got some renewable form of energy um, that, that, that is going gonna, is gonna to use up a lot of resources of another kind, maybe we should be taxing it. If, if uh, wind farms are going to take a whole bunch of land, yeah, we should probably tax them. Hydroelectric can have some very environmental damaging uh, 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 consequences, and that should be tax and caution. Um, and uh, and if we ever start building giant solar uh, solar panels in the deserts, that's probably that's going to be a lot of land use and could be environmental damaging. That's probably something we should tax. But if, in the stage we are now, I wouldn't really expect. I haven't heard about much of that, and I wouldn't expect much. It's really at this point we've got to get away from carbon. And, and into, into genuine renewables. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carl. And uh, Peter, would you still like to ask a question uh, quickly? And then we can- Sure, my, my question was to the Koreans, has there been any focus at all on the modern monetary uh, theory approach to finance for UBI? In other words, rather than thinking about the size of the deficit, look at the objectives and then see where you know, the budget may have to be trimmed or monetary uh, uh, or bonds raised and so forth in order to avoid inflation rather than just saying it has to be budget neutral as a principle or worry about the size of the deficit. Yeah. Professor, Mr. Ojuno Hyosan, any of you would like to respond to that? Yeah. All right. So uh, I am one of the uh, professors uh, supporting uh, candidate uh, Jemyung Lee. And uh, we have discussed a lot about uh, whether to introduce MMT as a means to finance uh, basic income. And most of the professors, uh, us, are actually in favor of that idea. However, we don't believe it's wise uh, to uh, provoke uh, basic income uh, debate uh, among the uh, economic uh, researchers in Korea in the run-up to the presidential election to bring in the idea of MMT. And um, as Mr. Young Sok -so mentioned briefly earlier, we can think of issuing government bonds at low uh, interest rate to make investment in large scale uh, government initiatives and uh, part of the uh, profit from it uh, can be used for basic income. So that's an indirect way of sourcing basic income from government bond. 
Yeah, thank you, Professor Khan. Uh, Mr. Ojuno or Hyosang, would you like to briefly respond? Otherwise, we can close. No, I don't have any further comments. Okay. Okay, I think uh, we have overshot just by 15 to six, 17 minutes, but I think this discussion has been really, really fascinating. I want to thank each panelist, each and every panelist. I mean, it's been really fantastic. It has opened so many questions. I don't think we can answer all the questions, but I think it has really opened the terrain. And I think I see a very strong case to create somebody can create a checklist for politicians when they are putting together or 30 questions they have to answer before they put together a manifesto. I think we are moving in that direction. Thank you so much. I think this has been fantastic. And thank you participants. You've been really wonderful. If somebody's question has not been answered, please pardon us. And maybe you can still write to us, you know where we are and who we are. Thank you so much. And we will close here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thanks to the organizers. Yeah. Thanks to and the translators. And translators. Thank you to the translators and organizers. It's been Thanks really all. wonderful translation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm staying. I stay back. Yeah.